difficulty that we have to keep in mind, otherwise we'd become just discouraged. But while we're here, we want to be as able as we can to be able to serve the Lord so that we might be able to live with him forever. He has a lot of great things in store for you and uh, for me. And don't deserve it, but he loves us that much, and that is what uh, really gives us, I think, great hope for the future. Um, you know, we are coming off of a holiday of Thanksgiving, and that's not going to be my subject today, but I do think about how um, unthankful and uh, how oftentimes I just don't really appreciate, I assume, blessings instead of really appreciating them for what they are. Maybe I'm not the only person in this room who has that problem, but I certainly believe that uh, when I look at my life and I think about um, all of the um, many ways in which I've been blessed in comparison with even some of my relatives. You know, my father was born in 1922. He'd have been 100 years old uh, this year. And uh, he lived through the Great Depression as a child. He saw the Second World War up close and personal. And then I think about his father. He lost a brother in the First World War. Why in the world would a kid from Clay County, Alabama, who had probably hardly ever been to Tennessee, wind up dead in France? Such is the way of men. And then you think about his grandfather who lived through the Civil War, the American Civil War, and all the aftermath and all the turmoil. And, and then I think about me. And I think about how little trouble I've seen like that. And how that I've never heard a shot fired in anger over my house by some foreign army. And I've never had to deal with the kind of things that they dealt with in so many ways. And I think about, boy, I have been blessed. I have been blessed. I tell you, I've been blessed to avoid religious persecution on the level that so many have seen it. I, I've been around a little while. I've been able to preach in a few places. I have never uh, had uh, the door broken open and somebody come in and say, what are you all teaching here today? Uh, take us out, roust us about, maybe take us off to jail. We, we saw some of that kind of thing in reference to some of the COVID restrictions in some places. But really, I can't say that I've suffered the kind of struggles that I read about in the New Testament. And the kind of things that I promise you went on somewhere today. Somewhere in this world, there were Christians who were uh, threatened for believing what they believed by the government. But having said that, I also realize, as you do, there's no guarantee that those blessings are going to continue. And I guess that's, this is not a weather report. This is uh, supposed to be a dramatic picture of the coming storm. Sometimes you, you, you think that uh, maybe you see clouds on the horizon. Let me make this clear. I'm not a prophet in the sense that I can foretell the future. I don't have any special private revelation, revelation from God, although I would say this, that I do think that the prophets of God in the scriptures sometimes provide some great lessons for us in how to deal with storms when they come. The, uh, the passage in Daniel chapter 4 is familiar to each of us, I trust. This is when Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, the number one man of the number one power in the world, uh, was walking uh, along uh, the uh, roof of his royal palace. He had been warned by the prophet, don't get too caught up in yourselves, don't become irreverent, don't forget God. But he just got so carried away with how wonderful he was and how big his kingdom was and how rich his house was, he just couldn't help himself, he thought. He said, is this not great Babylon that I built with my majesty, my mighty power, my royal residence, the glory of my majesty? And that's when the word came to him, you know. Uh, just as it was spoken to him, so it would be 
The kingdom is departed from you. Verse 32, you shall be driven from among men and your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. You'll eat grass like an ox. How's that for pride? You're not going to know that you're even a man till seven times pass over until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men and gives it to whom he will. A lesson you will not forget. I'll tell you, the Lord would do a lot of our leaders in this world, I'd say nearly all of them a favor if he'd turn them into oxen for seven times. They'd come out different. They'd come out better men. I think that the folks that are leading our world are just exactly like Nebuchadnezzar. They all think that they're in charge and it's through their smarts everything happens. They're all filled with that same kind of pride. And I'm not demeaning them. I'll tell you, if I had that kind of power, maybe I'd be just as foolish. But it's a bad mistake to make. Jeremiah, in uh, his prophecy, uh, sent warning to the nation surrounding Judah. There is none like you, O Lord. You are great and your name is great in might. Who would not fear you, O king of nations? For this is your due. For among all the wise ones of the nations and in all their kingdoms there is none like you. People do not consider God and they do so to their peril. We've been studying recently from Isaiah and that's what we're going to get to today eventually. But, you know, Isaiah 45 is a memorable chapter in this memorable book because this is where Isaiah calls the name by the knowledge of God of a man who was not yet born, wouldn't be born for another hundred years after the time of Isaiah and calls him by name and points out God's plan for him. Thus says the Lord to his anointed Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. He calls Cyrus his name. We read about Cyrus later in the text in the time of Daniel. I like to think that Daniel might have shown Cyrus this passage, this prophecy of Isaiah written 100 plus years before, calling him by name. And maybe that's why he treated Daniel and the God of Daniel with such kindness and deference. But notice what God says about Cyrus before he, ever, before he was ever born. He said, I will use him. He will be a tool in my hand. I, verse 2, will go before you. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze. Verse 3, I will give you the treasures of darkness in the hordes of the secret places, and you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by name. Verse 5, I am the Lord, and there is none other besides me. There is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me. The people may know, and the rising of the sun from the west and from the west, he says, that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. You believe that? I believe he still does. I believe the things that go on in this world, the things that we watch on the news, the things that we get so worried and wrapped up in and concerned about are all in the hand of God. It has always been so. And if we uh, just elect this guy, and if we just get this jet, and if we have a bomb this big, well, then we will, we will still be in the hand of God. I am the Lord who does all these things. Isaiah, in another passage in the 23rd chapter, writes about the city-state of Tyre. We haven't heard much about Tyre. There's still a city called Tyre. <clears throat> but at the time that this was written, it was a very wealthy powerful city-state. They controlled commerce and they made a ton of money and they had a fortified city. In fact, they had built a city on an island peninsula and uh, on a little island just off the coast and uh, they were, it seemed impregnable. But here's what Isaiah, God said through Isaiah, who has purposed this against Tyre? Their judgment is coming. 
the bestower of crowns, whose merchants were princes, whose traders were the honored of the earth. The Lord of hosts hath purposed it to defile the pompous pride of all glory, to dishonor all the honored of the earth. I think God's still in that business. And so I want to spend a few minutes today thinking with you about one last phase in our study of Isaiah. We began by talking about the king in Isaiah. The, the child is born and a son is given and his name should be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. A virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. And all the things that surrounded the king and his kingdom but I want before we leave our study of Isaiah to look at one more aspect that I think is very relevant to our life today as well. And that is that God has always been the king of nations. And he has always ruled them with a rod of iron. So I want to look at a few examples from the book of Isaiah and the lessons that they teach. Let me ask you to turn with me to, Babel, to the to 13th chapter and the story here of Babylon. Familiar with Isaiah, this book, uh, from chapter 13 through about chapter 23, Isaiah deals with one nation after another that God is going to judge. He calls it here the burden of Babylon, the old King James translation. Your translation may say the oracle. That's not a bad translation. It's a message, but it's a heavy message. I think that's why the word burden is chosen here by the old translator. It's a heavy message upon these nations because their time is almost up. You know, nations have a time, just like people do. They have a time. And God allows a nation to go so far, and then it's enough, and that's it. And just like people, we don't always know when that time is. But Babylon was about to find out. What's remarkable to me, and by the, I'm sorry to say, from chapter 13 through 23, you find several nations taking their turn, and really all the way through about chapter 35, you find these judgments upon the nations. What's remarkable to me, one thing remarkable about this judgment on Babylon is that it's a judgment on a nation that is on the rise. That is, it's a prediction of judgment. In the time that Isaiah is writing these words, Babylon has not quite yet reached its peak. The, the nation of Assyria is still in charge. They're still the dominant power. So what God does through Isaiah here, he not only predicts the rise of Babylon, but he predicts their fall. Who but God could know that? Who sees what God sees? Not only to predict that a nation will rise, but that it will rise and then after a period of time, it will fall and fall in this way. So 13 and 14 deals with the burden of Babylon. I do encourage you to take your Bible and turn with me, and we'll read together a few passages from Isaiah. The burden of Babylon, he begins. The burden of Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos did see. Lift ye up a banner upon the high mountain. Exalt the voice unto them that shake the hand that they may go into the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for my anger, even them that rejoice in my highness. The noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together, the Lord of hosts mustereth the host to battle. From a far country, from the end of the earth they come, even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. He's predicting here that Babylon will be overrun by a nation, in fact, by a nation of nations. He calls them my sanctified ones, not because they are in any sense pure, not holy in that sense, but they are set apart by me for this work. If you wonder who it is, you keep reading that in verse 17, Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them, which regard not silver. And as for gold, they delight not in it. Their bows shall also dash the young men to pieces. 
and they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare children. It is a, a particularly strong picture here of a people that God gathers to come and to overrun Babylon. Uh, he goes on to describe this as what he calls the day of the Lord. Look at verse 6. Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. That expression, the day of the Lord, is a significant expression, isn't it? As a Bible student, you run across it time and again. Now, I know many of you have been through this a number of times, but for those who might need a reminder, let me say that that expression, understood properly, does not refer to one day on the calendar. It's an expression that describes an event, if you will. Uh, as one fellow put it, the day of the Lord is not so much a when as a what. The day of the Lord has come through the years many times in history. What is the day of the Lord? Uh, it's, it's a day of conflict. It's a day of confrontation. It's a day of great upheaval. It's a day when God's cause will be victorious. It's a day when God's people will be both purged and separated. Purging is a painful process, by the way. In the day of the Lord, oftentimes God's people likewise suffer pain. But they are in the end benefited by having been called away from and separated from their enemies. It is a day in which men will be rewarded according to their deeds. It's a judgment day. Not necessarily the final judgment day. Certainly that would not fit here, would it? The day of the Lord here is not the final judgment. By the way, I believe in a final judgment. I believe one day God's going to bring it all to an end and there's going to be a judgment after this world has passed away. I believe that just as sure as I'm standing here. This world is not going to last forever. It hadn't been here forever. It won't be here forever. But when you read in a passage like Isaiah 13, we're reminded that the language of the prophets about the day of the Lord has, uh, has been an expression used to talk about the judgment of any number of nations. As one fellow put it, it's not the end of the world, but it's the end of Babylon's world. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That's what he said in the 21st chapter. And of course, John in Revelation borrowed that phrase, using Babylon figuratively to describe another great kingdom, an empire that would fall. But just remember that. Babylon's always fall. The day of the Lord will always come. We may not live to see it, but I promise you it will come. A day when God will be glorified over his enemies. Now we might ask, when will such a day come? Well, I think the best answer maybe would be to that. It will come when... The, the sin is too great and the remnant's too few. That's when it comes for a nation. That was true about Canaan. You remember the, what God said to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15? I'm going to give you this land. Great. <laughs> we might have, have said if we were in Abraham's place, hand me the keys. No, it's not like that. Now's not the time. In fact, he said, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. That's exactly how he expressed it. That's an interesting picture, isn't it? That, uh, that it almost like there's a tank and, and it just fills up with sin to a point where now it's overflowing. And God is patient and God is waiting and God is hoping for repentance. But there comes a point in time and God knows, I don't know, God knows when this people have run out of chances and the sin is too great and the remnant too few I think again about Genesis chapter 18, another day of the Lord, a judgment that came upon Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain and how God spoke to Abraham about that. Now, Abraham was deeply concerned about it for uh, one reason is because his, his beloved nephew was down there and his family. And so uh, because the Lord said, the cry of Sodom, verse 20 of Genesis 18, the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grievous. That's why God sent those angels down. And the message came then to Abraham. He said, Oh, let me not be, let not the Lord be angry, peradventure I will speak yet once. 
if there be ten found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of ten. Ten. Ten righteous people would have saved the city. But uh, there weren't ten there. I'll tell you, I'm not sure there were two there. And so God uh, is, uh, is, is merciful. But his mercy is not limitless. His mercy is not forever. And I think we see that true here in Babylon. Look at the prophetic language with me. In the 13th chapter and in verse 10. Back in chapter 13 and verse 10. The stars of heaven and the constellations shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his goings forth. And the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Now he's describing here the destruction of Babylon, but that's how he describes it. As being like, a, 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 like the universe collapsing, a, a total uh, destruction of the, of the universe itself coming into pieces. The stars of heaven, uh, the, the sun, the moon, everything as it were simply uh, caving in because of this great destruction not of the universe itself literally being destroyed, but a destruction upon the people, the people of Babylon. It's the, this, uh, what somebody called the prophetic hyperbole. In the 13th verse, again, I will shake the heavens and the earth shall be removed out of her place. The wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. You have this picture of Babylon, this great and mighty nation being destroyed and brought to his knees. He said it's like the stars collapsing. It's like the sun and moon, the heavens themselves, and the earth being shaken to its core. And that's what is coming for this great nation of Babylon. The day of the Lord is at hand. I think I'll, I'll begin there tonight and talk more about this picture of judgment in the prophets. And then I want to draw a very specific and, and I hope a, uh, a very practical point for you and I about how we ought to look at this world and the things that we ought to be aware of and we ought to be prepared for in days to come. I appreciate your kind attention this morning and we'll make, uh, we'll make this uh, our starting point this evening. If you're here and you're not a child of God, I, I would encourage you to think carefully and seriously you know, one day, I don't care how mighty men think they are, they will not stand against the judgment of God. And I don't believe that any of us ought to ever deceive ourselves into thinking that somehow we are powerful enough that we can uh, flaunt God's will and live in rebellion to Him and somehow get away with it. It will not work. And so if you're here and you're not on the side of the Lord, you've not, your sin has not been covered by the blood of Christ, let me plead with you to make a change today. If you're here as one who has a child of God, has uh, gotten away from the, the only thing that really matters in life. Let me tell you, if we go out in that parking lot today and the sky opens up and it's the day that the Lord comes back, not one thing is going to matter except where I stand with God. That's all that matters right now. And so let me plead with you. To, 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 let's make our priorities what they ought to be. Let's put God in his place. Let's ask and beg his forgiveness. If we've got something to make right, make it right. But do that today because the God that we serve, well, as the Hebrew writer said, quoting the Old Testament, he said it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Would you be a child of God today? Would you obey him, come to him? Do so even right now while we stand and while we sing.